Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Glad to see you here after the lunch. So, um, we will be talking today about the standard C++ toolset. The very first disclaimer is that I'm from JetBrains, but I'm not going to dedicate this talk to our tools. Like, I will be mentioning them for sure because we're the part of the landscape, uh, luckily. But if you want to know more, come to our booth. Uh, Upstairs, right? <laughs> I'm a little bit lost in the direction. So yeah, we have a booth so you can come and discuss our tools in details if you want um, anything. So we're happy to help there. So um, another disclaimer is that talking about the C++ tool set, this time I'm gonna, in the very end, include a very brand new part of the tool set related to AI. So stay to the end, uh, we'll talk about it later. And the last disclaimer is that I have some presents for those who will be asking questions. <laughs> so some um, nice power banks, which I will present to the three best questions today. So just a little bit engage you for the discussion. Uh, okay, very briefly. So if you don't know me, uh, my name is Anastasia. I worked for eight years in, uh, as a C++ developer in various embedded and telecom areas. I was launching 4G networks, doing various like telecom devices, whatever, very fun stuff. But then I joined JetBrains, where I work as surprisingly product marketing manager, but I'm still like, you know, a C++ developer uh, in HUD. Uh, you can reach out to me in Twitter. So uh, pretty much uh, often replying to the Twitter. So if you need something, just ping me there. And also if you somewhere around Amsterdam, I'm now living in Amsterdam and helping the, uh, the Dutch C++ user group there. So if you're around, maybe you can do a talk or just join us for the meetup. You're very welcome. We have a very nice community. Okay, so talking about the tool set, I would like to start with a very important table. And it's about the frustration, because the tools are actually there to help you. And one part of their job is to help with your frustration and to limit it, to cut it off. So what, what are the things the C++ developers are frustrated with? Uh, very simple. C++ Foundation luckily asks all of us about it every year. And we have a very nice table, which is more or less stable, I would say, from year to year. So uh, the green lines here stayed on top of this table for years. The pink lines moved a little bit up uh, recently. This is the, these are the results, by the way, from 2023, so this year, actually. So if you look at it, you'll find out that there are many things around, many things around tools there. So it's about like how to manage libraries, or how to build the projects, what are the build times, or how to set up like the DAF environments, the CI pipelines, so everything around your setup. So it's a lot about tools. There are things about the language, the typical things about the C++, which are also frustrating people, like the type safety or the security issues. This is like all understandable, but from year to year, it's the second part of this table, not the first one, and mostly about the tools. So the people are frustrated with the complexity of the setup around the C++ coding. It's, it's come and start coding in C++. No, we're not in this world. <laughs> So we have lots of things, and they're really bothering people. And you see like how the project models are moving to the top, and they're always there. So even though they're improving a lot, they're still there. OK, the tool set, can it help us? But before we answer this question, let's just discuss, briefly define what is this tool set. I used to divide the tools in the ecosystem into two groups, essential tools and complementary tools. Essential tools are the tools you just can't work without. So if you do the C++, you probably need some compiler, uh, you need some build system, or at least some way to explain the compiler how to build your project. You need some libraries, uh, lucky if you have them, or you need to you know, write these libraries. Um, you probably need the debugger. Complementary tools are the tools you kind of can live without, but it's better to have them. Like the code analyzer or the unit testing framework or the profiling tools, it's good when you have them and it brings you some benefits, but yeah, you're kind of okay if you don't have them or you can't use them in your environment. So where are we uh, among the other languages? Let's just briefly comp uh, compare. So I just selected four big languages here to compare to, which is Java, Ruby, Swift, and Rust. And if we take a look, actually, they do have kind of standard compiler. Uh, it's a very standard uh, compiler for Java, like Swift is using the Apple toolchain. Rust uh, compiler is also standard. 
Like in Ruby, they have different compiler techniques implemented in different compilers. I like kind of their approach a lot because they have a lot of compilers, but all of them are different. It's like uh, either interpreter or some JIT or something. And I like that they have this nice task called uh, rail singularity. If you don't know about it, there is a huge framework called Ruby on Rails. And every compiler which is in the landscape has to manage to compile this Ruby on Rails. Otherwise, it's not in the landscape. Anyway, so they have different compilers, but they're for reasons. I mean, they're implementing different techniques with different compilers. So libraries, there are lots of good libraries for these languages, and usually they're managed nicely via, like, uh, for example, for Rust, it's like these crates, and you use it with Cargo, which is a very standard project model everyone is using for Rust. And so the crates are help, uh, helping people with all these libraries. And like in Swift, the tool chain is absolutely standard. It's all coming from Apple. It has some downsides because if you take, for example, Apple LDB, it's not the mainstream LDB. If you take the Apple Clank, it's not the mainstream Clank. So it has to be accurate. But generally, you don't need anything when you're starting with Swift. So you just take the uh, tool chain from Apple and you're done. You have everything. So you don't need any other tools because they're all with you already. So yeah, and all of the things are also quite standard here. I mean, like for example, for Java, there are three popular project models like Maven, Gradle, and Ant. But like Maven is uh, on top, the Gradle is the second one. They have their reasons for being used in the community, but they, these are actually the standards. So I mean, like uh, there is not a huge variety. Um, so let's take a look. Now, so what does the uh, standard tool set actually mean? How does it help? So what, what are the benefits of having something standard? So first of all, it helps the newbies. When the new people are coming to the language or to the project or to the ecosystem, it's quite easy when you just provide them like, you know, the Docker container with some standard tool set or just tell, yes, use this, this is the standard tool set. So that they don't, you know, spend a day of searching for all the tools they need to install and configure and they already know how to use them. And then we come to this question about onboarding, because when you have a dev environment pre-configured, say the Docker container, which is a fantastic thing, you just give it to your new member of the team and say like, use it. Everything is in it, so you don't have to search for tools. You don't have to, you know, uh, feel all these pains of figuring the deaf environment on your machine. So just use it. Uh, and of course, it helps with the code education because some tools sometimes have different approaches, and you start writing different code. And it's not just about the tools, but also about the writing the code in different ways about it today later, but code unification is a good thing because like, it's easier to maintain the code which is kind of unified, which is written in more of a standard way. Uh, and of course, the best practice is adoption, which comes as a consequence of this code unification. So if you unify properly, you probably bring some uh, you know, good practices into it. And of course, the code sharing. That's more about the dependencies, the libraries, how you can share that. So the standard tool set is kind of good, right? So, uh, what's happening with C++? So, the variety, is it good or bad? Let's think about it for a little. So, from one perspective, having, for example, like four major compilers, and I guess it's even more than four because there's all these GCC-based versions for embedded tools. Even Intel has like Intel and Intel LVM, so there are like more than four, but let, let's just call it now four for the sake of this talk. So, uh, but they are all very different. And it brings, first of all, to the fact as that it generates different assemblers. And then it means that the different performance and the different approaches for optimizations is involved. You can probably ask Matt Colbold uh, here at the conference about all the crazy cases uh, in this direction. But also like that's about the different error reporting and the utilization level. Like if you ever try to compare the error, for example, about some template issues in Clang and GCC, you will be feeling like on completely two different planets. They are different. They're talking about different things to you. And if you are like a newbie trying to understand what's going on, for example, or just trying to understand what this error means, it completely blows your mind when you see a different error about the same thing in different compiler. But also it brings some interesting, uh, I would say, side effects to the those who are working with these tools. For example, as a vendor, we work with the compilers a lot, and the typical question for us is like for, for the IDE, we need to extract the compiler predefined macros from the compiler. 
And you know what? It's done the same way in GCC and Clang, but it's completely different than MSVC. Moreover, this way for MSVC, it's kind of new. Like five years ago, you can do that. I mean, so the very simple task, just to ask compiler about the compiler predefined macros, there is no standard way of doing that. So you do that in a completely different way. Another example of the differences which might be here is about the syntax style. What I love about the C++ language is that it's very powerful. You can do many things. But the downside is that sometimes you can do one thing in 10 different ways. And that also blows your mind because, I mean, like, okay, it's fine to discuss what are you using maybe, like where you would like to put the auto. Then it's fine maybe to discuss if it's east const or west const, that like take some time. Uh, but then we come like where, uh, where I should be using like in return type or how to use the virtual keyword. So all these things, there are actually quite many of them. And I can just show you how many of them we have, just because um, quite recently in our tools, we implemented the settings for configuring the syntax styles. And this is just half of the table. Just the syntax style for C++, if you try to like configure it, and it's very different, for example, the core lines and for example, the guidelines or the Unreal Engine coding, they sometimes have like quite uh, the contrary uh, spots there. So, and if you try to configure it, that's like really lots of settings. That's literally half of the table in the tool we have. So you can configure it in many ways. And it's good when you have a tool which can actually fix that for you. So say like change the trailing return type. So then yeah, you're good. You kind of change the style quickly. But if you don't have that, then you'll have a code pieces in different code bases written in different code style. And it's probably not very good for you. Okay, so C++, where are we now with the C++ kind of standard tool set? Um, I like this picture from Bryce talk. <laughs> yes, Bryce, that's from your talk from C++. I really loved it because it shows the C++ in all the variety. Because the C++ is for many things. They're quite complex and quite different. There are lots of platforms and areas of applicability involved. So the language can't be the same for all of them. That's fine. So uh, probably that's acceptable. But let's see. Um, what then we have, so what the people do use. So let's get back to the compilers. So uh, I added a few more here, taking into the consideration some embedded systems as well. So uh, to Clang and GCC and MSVC and Intel. So yeah, there is a whole family of like embedded compilers. And I have to say that they're very different. If you take the GCC based compiler in the embedded area, like I had this experience in the past. Every time it gets you like some different results, so it has the different speed of adoption of the new like language features, it provides some different assembly code. And of course that's done to like adopt better for the specific hardware, but then it produces lots of issues when you work with this compiler. So if you take a look what people are usually using, and I just took the results of the two surveys here, the developer ecosystem survey we do in JetBrains since 2017. These are the results of 2022, because the 2023 we are now collecting the results, so you can fill, uh, fill the survey and like kind of uh, provide your input. And the C++ Foundation uh, survey from 2023. And like, yeah, you can see that there are lots of people, at least in our survey, using the GCC. And in foundation survey, there are more people using MSVC. I kind of understand the reason of this difference, because I guess the audiences are different between the foundation and developer ecosystem survey. But generally, you can see the trends. So there are like major compilers here, and then uh, all the others. Um, the differences between compilers are actually quite not uh, noticeable when you start working with them. So for example, the very simple thing when you want just to enable all the warnings in the compilers. And if you want to run the universal way into your build system, say, enable all the warnings in the compiler, you have to write this crap, you know, because it's different. I mean, you have to do this if clause in your, for example, CMA code, saying like, if that's the MSVC, then I will enable these options. Luckily for GCC and Clang, that's, these are the same. But like, yeah, it's not always true. That just because that's, these are the basic options. But also there are issues with the compatibility 
talking about the standard option. So if you take a look at the recent like C++ 23 features, the compilers are very different, but okay, like that's 23. Maybe we can go a little bit early. Okay, let's go a little bit early and compare the three major features of C++ 20. Um, that's not the most fresh state. It was taken maybe a couple of months ago, this screenshot, but still, three major features of the standard released three years ago and the three major compilers are still quite different. So if you uh, were at the talk of Danielle about the models today, you've also noticed that fact. So the three major features of the major standard have major differences among major compilers. That's our reality, just take it. Um, but Clank, if we talk about the Clank specifically, is much more than just a compiler. That's also important here because the GCC, yes, so it has all these varieties for embedded, MSVC, which is super popular, for example, in game dev, but Clank is something different. It's a whole ecosystem. And there are many tools built on top of it. So it's not just about the Clank analyzer and Clank tidy for the code checkers, but it's also like the tools which are in this ecosystem. So it's like many IDEs which are these days using Clang as the language engine. And actually every tool which needs an AST works with Clang because it's much easier, it already builds it. And the Clang was already built with this idea of the incremental tool in mind, not just a compiler, which helps. So um, probably Clang in that sense is even more different than others because it has a different like, you know, area of applications. So it's literally the basis for many C++ tools these days. So it has some different, you know, big goal. And this is good we have it, but this produces sometimes even more differences between the compilers. Okay, um, project models. You probably know this story, but there are plenty of project models in C++. Like if you want to just simply build some code in C++, you just give up because like you start doing what to, where to go. Should I just take my compiler, pass some options and build it? Or should I worry about the project model? If it's a big project with many libraries, you probably have to worry about the project model. And then you come to the fact that there are like this CMake, I must build make files, uh, like Ninja as a build tool, Xcode, Kubernetes, Bazel, whatever, much more there actually. Um, CMake is on top and it's on top for many years now. And I literally saw it growing. <laughs> so when we started doing our C++ tools, CMake was not on top. It was MSVC, but we noticed that trend how CMake became a standard in C++. It uh, started growing several years ago, and it's now on top, and it's used across um, like many libraries. Quite often, if you, for example, search on GitHub for a library, you can find a CMake file to build this library, which is good. And many project dependency managers are now trying to, first of all, integrate with CMake, and ID integration with CMake. So, uh, yeah, just again for Bryce, Bryce quote from the C++ <laughs> now. So if you want a C++ build system, a standard one, you got one, it's CMake. And you can love it or hate it, but again, that's our reality. Um, CMake adoption actually also is a quite complex. So apart from the fact that it was integrated for many libraries, for package managers, for IDEs, also you notice some big moves like Qt, which moved from QMake to CMake, which was a very unusual move from like some perspective, but very logical if you think about it deeper, like, yeah. So they actually uh, took the most popular project model instead they're a custom one, which is a good move because now you can easier take the cute libraries into your code with CMake. Embedded, they also started moving to CMake, which was a big surprise for me because I worked for eight years with Embedded. I never heard of these people could move out of make files and you know, out of tools. They still are with their like beloved out of tools. Um, it's still a pain, but many of them are moving to CMake, like Zephyr, Toss, Nordic Semiconductor, they moved to CMake. So all their big SDKs and libraries are now moving to CMake. And that's a matter of adoption. So if you want your library to be adopted widely, you start moving to CMake. That's the trend. And yeah, I saw this fantastic effort, which is still not there, but like, yeah, the people are trying to move boosts to CMake. Let's see if they succeed. Good luck to them. Uh, but it's, it's a tough piece. I mean, it will take a while. Give them some time. They, they just still need some time. Um, 
I think the best part of it, the best part of this evolution was then when CMake file API appeared actually, because that gave the tools the ability to work with CMake in some natural way. Because before that, to get some information out of CMake, you actually had to run it. And if you run CMake on any reasonable size project, you know that it takes ages. Because it really takes ages. It does some good job, but you don't need it most of the time. CMake file API gives you an ability to interact with the project model as the black box and to ask it for some questions like, what are the files in this project? What like? So uh, how are they, where they're located, what are the like compilation keys, whatever. So you can ask many questions and it's a very um, evolving API, I would say. We use it in our tools. I know how like quickly it evolves and it's great. Um, so, and the libraries are now relying on it. The other big thing which happened to CMake was CMake presets. Like thanks to Microsoft collaboration with Kitware, they polished it, they nailed it, and now we have kind of a standard way of configuring CMake. So instead of you know providing settings in the command line and in all different ways and different tools, you know just take the specific files, specific JSON files with the predefined format. Okay, it's not that predefined because it's still breaking the compatibility but it evolves, it's young enough. So that, that's just, uh, that's also fine. But you kind of have this way and the tools are just learning how to work with these presets and they just read this file and gets the configuration for the CMake. And actually there's more. Uh, I don't know if any other language could have this fantastic thing like a debugger for the project model. <laughs> but in our reality, we need to have a debugger for the project models and we have it. So we started this effort with like, there was some like old project um, done by some, I don't remember the company name. Then we took uh, this effort um, in C line and then it was like a huge contribution by Microsoft, which is now in CMake 327 with the like building debugger for CMake. And it's fantastic because like, yeah, CMake is a hard language. As I said, it's good for quizzes. Take this talk from Mateo again from C++ now. For half an hour of, for first half an hour of his talk, he's doing a CMake quiz. I failed there. I was at this talk. I failed completely. I worked with CMake for years, but like to understand why these people have that many, uh, say, variables for saying true or false, you just need to be crazy enough. But like, yeah, we have the CMake debugger which we can kind of use to debug the things uh, with the CMake. And it's now more or less standard because it's like part of the CMake uh, 27. But moreover, you can even profile the CMake as a language. And I mean, not the build step, but the CMake configuration step itself. So it has these profiling arguments, you can pass them. And like in C line, we even build these nice uh, graphs for the profiling output, or you can just do that in the you know um, terminal so that's the standard profiling arguments and you can profile the CMake and understand which actual configuration steps, uh, which of them are taking more time and kind of improve. Uh, the interesting story about the CMake was about the modelers. So uh, Daniela had just recently a great talk, but I just read, read briefly on the story. So it all started with CMake and VS generators. So that was the more or less first really usable implementation, I mean, which you can use with the kind of trending compiler and the build system. Because when the people started coming to us as an ID asking when you're gonna have the model as support, I was always asking them in return, do you already have the project model which supports them? How are you gonna use them? And they were like, oh no, we still don't have it, okay, bye. And I mean, that was the whole conversation because you can't use the feature of the language if it's not in the project model. Because we are all relying on these build systems and project models. So CMake, uh, with the VS generator was the first. The code was a little bit creepy. It then improved. It also uh, got the support for GCC and like clang some compilation flags. It was still a little bit of a mess in terms of the CMA code because no, uh, nowhere here you have a understanding that we're talking about the models if you take the CMake code. It was improved again with CMake uh, 325 and then further uh, updates when some like, you know, magic keywords like file set were used finally. And you can even now with CMake uh, 
26, yes, so you can even ask the file API of the CMake about the models. That is a big move because now the tools can know that you're working with the models and not just the file sets, which is something very abstract. So, um, yeah, if you missed the talk, I'm sorry for you, it was great <laughs> regarding the models, but you can watch the recording properly. Uh, Daniel just nicely explained how it now goes with the, like, you know, uh, building the uh, models in the current landscape. But the um, the third here is that CMake actually is not just evolving, but it also capturing on the most recent updates to the language. So it's kindly, uh, it's finally nailed this model story. You got it done. You can now use it with the CMake. The tools, the extra tools, they can now rely on the CMake file API to extract this information about the modelers. So the whole puzzle is built now. So now you can start using modelers, apart from some drawbacks, but still a good time now. Okay, uh, dependencies. So this is a big pain point for C++ here, right? So managing dependencies is hard because we kind of don't have a standard way and probably won't have it for maybe forever, I don't know. But we have some nice tools and they are growing in their usage like both VC package and Conan. Uh, they have some uh, growth in terms of the adoption. And I guess that C++ Foundation audience, which is uh, a bit more professional, I mean, like there is, for example, a question how many years of C++ experience you have in the Foundation survey, and the audience is like three times more professional than the DEFAC, which is a more average. And you can see that the numbers for the package manager uh, are actually bigger for the Foundation. But uh, that's not that important. The important fact is that it's growing year over year. Yes, it's very slow. Yes, it takes some time, but it's growing. Uh, of course, we see like the majority of people which are just still build their libraries as part of their build. I hope that one day we'll come to the situation when it's done with some specific tools. But these tools are also like uh, we need to get a better adoption for them. Maybe we need some uh, unification in the language for at least querying with these tools because VC package and Conan, they're very different. And I can say that just recently we were implementing the VC package support in C line and we had the Conan plugin made by the JFrog team for, for ages. Uh, it stopped working recently with the, their new release, which they're now updating it. But uh, anyway, so we did the implementation for the VC package and just to learn about how our integration works for people, we had some UX session with the C++ developers asking them about their experience. And we learned that the people are using VC package in that many ways. So it's completely like different. The scenarios were all different. So we talked to like maybe 10 people and they were all using it differently. So we realized that there are many still spots uncovered in the tool, but that's mostly because we were targeting like maybe one, two or maximum three scenarios, but the people have more because there is manifest mode now in VC package. So in, some of them are using it with the manifest mode. Some of them are still doing the old style VC package and you have to adopt the tool and the like the the UI and the whole UX story to that different scenario. So maybe when we nail that, maybe when everyone is more or less on the same workflow, uh, we can get the high adoption rate for the um, like uh, package managers. Uh, if we talk about some other tools in the um, tool set, there is the uh, formatting tool, and here I have. I have to say that we have a standard tool like, yeah, so Clang format is a standard for everyone. In every uh, project on a GitHub, you can find the Clang format config most of the time. So because the people do put their open source project to the repository along with the uh, formatting config. And that's fine, it's a standard tool. There are some issues, however, around the tool itself because um, Clang format is actually an interesting tool because while it's part of the Clang ecosystem, but it's not using the Clang parser. <laughs> so to work uh, faster, it's using some fuzzy parser. And sometimes it provides you with the results very different from the main Clang parser. And you can notice that. Like I did similar talk at Core C++ less than a month ago, and the person came to me and said like, now I understand why we have this issue with the Clang format. <laughs> I mean, so it really happens in some production codes. And they're also breaking the compatibility in terms of the settings. And that's a big pain point because quite often they do change, for example, the um, 
say, the true false uh, variable to some enumeration value. And it completely breaks the whole config and the people have to switch to, you know, another version of the Clang format or stick with the old one. And that's kind of hard. So they are not keeping this compatibility between the uh, Clang format versions and you have to be accurate with that. But apart from that, that's kind of a very standard tool and it's used in the community widely. Now the code analysis. So. Um, it's interesting to see that the people are actually enabling code analysis on all major stages. So not just when they are like editing the code or compiling the code, but they are also enabling the code analysis on CI CD, like these 26% who are using it in the CI CD pipelines. So the people do appreciate the benefits they get from the code analysis tools. Still, there is a very interesting trend that when we ask people what specific tool they use, like one third says that they use nothing. I do hope that these are these people who are doing at least on CI CD. Um, but then there are quite many people, uh, like this year it was 37% uh, who told us that they use whatever they have in the IDE. So which puts kind of um, uh, a responsibility on us as a vendor that we have to bundle, you know, the best code analysis tools because otherwise in them. If they don't have them in their IDE or editing tool, they're not using it. But of course, there are a lot of tools from the Clang ecosystem like uh, Clang Analyzer and Clang Tizy. And funny fact that I, I don't think the Clang format is a code analysis tool, but every time I put this survey, mm -hmm. the people put this option to the other option. So I just started adding it to the option and we have quite many people selecting Clang format. I don't know why you think the Clang format is a code analysis tool, but let it be here. Um, and there are actually much more tools which are under 4%, so I didn't put it uh, here, but there are other code analysis tools which the people uh, do use. And of course, the Clang Tidy is the most popular of all these like third-party tools which the people are using. And that's the baseline right now for the you know, uh, code analysis. The people are using Clang Tidy quite often either in their ID if they have some integration or like separately or when they compile in the code or on CI CD. And there are many good checks and if you haven't tried the Clang Tidy, you probably have to start doing that right now. So there are some good checks for modernizing the code for core guidelines. Like for example, it doesn't cover the whole core guidelines, it's far from that. But at least it has a dozens of like maybe uh, 20, 40 good checks from the core, core guidelines, which you can just run on top of your code base and capture some possible issues. But of course, the best part about Clang Tidy is that you can write your own custom check, right? So you can do the customization in your company and write, write uh, some specific check and run it on top of your code base, for example, on CI CD or like on your local. So the Clang Tidy integration is now essential and um, like nearly all the IDEs these days are integrating with the Clang Tidy. So you don't have to worry about it most of the time. Uh, another story about the code analysis is about this data flow analysis. Um, I personally love it very much because it's capable of catching this very typical C++ issues like dangling pointers or lifetimes or index out of bounds things and many others. So how does it work? So the data flow analysis is the analysis that can analyze how the data flows through the uh, control graph and then make some assumptions on top of that. It might sound complex and it usually takes some time, but if you optimize it properly and do a proper tooling, then it can give you some good results. I would like to share just one story which we recently tried because we, we have some people in the team who are keen on data flow analysis since university, so they're doing their job. And uh, we recently ran our data flow analysis on top of the Dooms code, just because it's a nice example of the code you can uh, get and try. And we actually found a nice issue like index out of bounds, which we managed to reproduce. So we first got a like, notification from the analysis tool. And when we managed to create an actual example to replicate that. So they were just like, yeah, some, uh, some variable and uh, yeah, it has some, uh, some, uh, some wrong values. So we managed to get this uh, index out of bounds, and we even managed to create an example. So we just put some text uh, to some define, 
And after adding the apostrophe, we got the index out of bound exception. So <laughs> uh, it works. I mean, like we just run the code analysis and we were trying to understand if the data flow analyzer just shows us the proper result, if it's valid or not, if it's a false positive or if it's the uh, correct warning. And we were very much surprised that we managed to find something in the Doom's code. But yeah, so uh, this thing can help. And the good thing about it is that uh, you can build it in the function scope, and then the analysis will be very limited because it will be just running inside one function. But then you can extend it to the translation unit. It's possible and it doesn't take like tons of time. But uh, we stopped on that point, but I know there are like proof of concept that you can extend this to the cross-translation unit level. So there was a tool by Ericsson presented at some LLVM meeting uh, several years ago when they uh, did like a small proof of concept on top of Clang, a very basic analyzer, so it's not capable of like uh, complex checks, but just some basic ones. And they just extended from the translation unit to the cross-translation unit level. And it shows that it's actually possible, we just need to involve um, like more time and some efforts to make it uh, like nice performance-wise. But uh, it's good that you can actually, in the future, probably will have this cross translation unit analysis and you can just try and search for, say, index out of bounds on the whole project. Why not? <coughs> so uh, talking about the code analysis, actually, there are more tools which are specific to some dialects. And by dialects, I mean some, you know, DSL, uh, domain-specific languages here. So for example, for Q, there is Clazy. So if you work with Q, you probably know about it. It's the code analyzer, which it's not checking the code in terms of the regular C++. So you can do that with the Clang tidy. But if you want to, uh, for example, check the code and speak about your code in the language of like the signals and the other entities from Qt, Clazy is good at that, so it can capture these things. There is also Unreal Header tool for Unreal Engine, which is capturing some specific things about Unreal Engine macros, because if you don't know the whole, uh, like, Part, huge part of the Unreal Engine as a like, gaming engine is done on top of ooh, macros. So, and it's uh, definitely a pain. So if you uh, like write, write them sorry, incorrectly, so there is a huge um, analysis tool which helps you capture some specific issues about this, um, about this macros. And there are also lots of embedded checkers. So uh, quite often the vendor suggests uh, having these embedded checkers and you can take them from the vendor for the specific version of the compiler or something. Uh, then I also note, uh, mentioned that there is a huge part of the uh, C++ developers who are using code analysis on CI. And I have to say that I do treat that as a separate use case. It's not that, uh, because some people think about the CI is like, okay, I'm lazy enough, I will run my code analysis on CI. No, it's not about that. So you should be running your analysis if you can do that on your machine, like while you're compiling or right when you're typing the code. But sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes the target platform is not available or it's really resource greedy and you simply can't launch it locally. Then you do that on a CI. For example, you like commit the code and then uh, does some checks on the CI and that, for example, like after that merges your request and provide you some report. And it's actually very good for the open source projects. So it's kind of a health check for the open source project, right? So you have something running on your CI, checking that the uh, like external contribution doesn't break anything. So you run this code analysis. Uh, you can do that as part of the pull request, for example. That's what the uh, Sonar tools are capable of. So like doing that as a part of the pull request process. And we also have the tool called Kadana, similar to Sonar tools, so you can actually run your code analysis on CI. So with JetBrains Kadana, the idea is a little bit different from Sonar. So it's not about like uh, get giving you an external CI CD tool, but more about bringing our analysis from the IDEs to the CI if you need that. Um, yeah, so I actually talk more about the code analysis in my talk, uh, and there is a recording from C++ Now, for example, if you want to learn more about how to do this uh, data flow analysis, what's this actually capable of, so you can learn uh, more there in this talk, and like there, there are recordings. Um, unit testing, so important uh, thing to mention here is like, yeah, unit tests and 
People do different types of testing. It's not about the unit test. Some people do the like integration test or performance test. We are usually focusing on unit testing, but it's still important to understand that there are like you know other approaches, and it's just one uh, part of the story. But anyway, so um, most of the developers do understand that the testing plays an important role in their development process. And in the C++ world, most of them are using Google Tests. No surprise here. But catch, boost test, uh, doc test, whatever you prefer, are still there in the landscape. Catch was growing uh, fast, but I guess after they switched from the header on the approach, the, it uh, got some slowdown from the community adoption. So I don't know, maybe it will still be growing or maybe there will be other uh, options. So um, yeah, so Google test is kind of a default option here. The main issue about that is that you need to figure out how to properly get it and compile it because it's again about the project model and dependency managers. But I guess it's just the uh, basic test for any package manager if you can get the Google test uh, out of it because if you can't, probably that's not a proper project man uh, dependency management tool. So yeah, most of them just start with the Google test at least. So um, this task is kind of solved. So when you come and say like, yeah, I would like to use Google test in my project. Also, if you talk about the unit testing, there is uh, this topic of uh, code coverage. So like we, after you actually wrote some unit testing, like how many, how big parts of your code are actually covered. And you can calculate the coverage differently. It could be line coverage or statement coverage or branch coverage. You have to understand what are you calculating. Otherwise, you'll be confused that the results are different from tool to tool. Um, and actually, that's what happens when you use the tools in C++ because there is LVM cuff and G cuff. So uh, one mostly like used for Clang and the other for GCC. But the thing is that they sometimes behave differently in terms of the branch coverage. So you have to understand that sometimes you get like 100% coverage with one and less than 100 with other. And you are very much surprised. You just need to understand that it treats the exceptions and the branches differently. So, but if you know the difference, then like, yeah, um, you just get the result and you can maybe add more unit tests to get a better coverage. And now, as I promised, time for AI. <laughs> like um, language models slash language models are coming to uh, like our life. You can, you can treat it differently. There are lots of discussions these days about like if we can use it, if that's okay, if like it's trained on word pieces of code. I don't want to get into these discussions. <laughs> um, I just want to show how uh, we can maybe use them in a proper way to get benefits for our development process. Maybe there will be some regulation that will limit us from something in the future. That's also a okay, case, so we'll just follow that. But let's see what actually we have and what they're capable of. So actually, there are quite many tools now for developers specifically in the landscape. So GitHub Copilot um, is probably one of the most popular ones these days. Uh, there is also very um, nice tool uh, like Codium and Kodi by Sourcecraft. And just recently, like two days ago, we released AI in our JetBrains tools. So uh, how can it help the developers? So I think there are a few important things uh, here because you can think about the AI like, uh, you know, a chat. You go to it and you ask questions and it provides you answers and then you can, you know, copy the answer to your ID. You probably can think about it, I don't need an integration or something in my tool for that. I can just go to the open AI, ask questions and proceed. But it's not about it. So the proper integration so that it's really helpful involves the integrating into the daily routine natively. So that you don't have to think about, I need to go to some other, you know, tool window or to some, you know, browser and ask the questions. The proper integration should be helping you natively and essentially so that you just type the code, you get some, for example, uh, notification or something from your tool, from your ID, for example, which kind of helps you. And if it helps you, then you are good. Um, it has to take all the uh, context aspects into account. So it has to be about the programming, it has to be about the technology you are using, and it has to take your project context into account. Otherwise, it's just providing you answers which are not relevant to your project, right? And yeah, the integration has to be essential. 
And uh, we think that that's super important right now because you can do, you know, a sheet integration where you just bring the chatbot and that's it. And that's what we all start with, just to start with something. But then you have to think about how to make it more essential for the developers. Say, you can put just AI action and that's the screenshots from what we released a couple of days ago. So you can just select the piece of code and ask AI, suggest me refactoring or find the potential problems. At least this is much better than the chat already because it, you selected the code and this is the context. You don't need to copy that to some other chat bot or some other window because this is the context exactly. And the AI integrated into your tool should know about that. Or like, for example, for CMake, we decided to add this small tip, like explain with AI. So when your CMake fails in your like tool, uh, you can either debug it, you see this small tip, or you can ask AI to help you. Say, what's going on? Why it failed? How can I improve it? And the AI can like provide you some answer and like help you fix the code. So, for example, there's just some uh, like yeah, animation recorded from our tool where I have some uh, shitty code dealing with the array incorrectly and <laughs> putting some uh, word test to it. So my test fails. You can see that from the test output. So what I want to do, I want to select the code and ask AI to find the issues in that code. Uh, I will need to wait for a while because AI will be like, yeah, printing the long answer to me explaining what's going on. In the end, it will suggest me some code which I can finally copy and insert and rerun my test and it will be successful. Yep, so the test works. So this is what I call the essential integration. So when you just select the code and ask AI to help, like, yeah, and then you just um, copy and like paste it and see how it works for there. Another nice case for me, at least as a C++ developer, is to ask AI to help with modelers. Because every time when I try to start with modelers and like, how to do that? <laughs> how to convert my non modelless code to modelless code? Why not to ask AI about it? So say I have a project, I can ask AI help me to introduce modelers into my project. Uh, if I'm lucky enough, it will provide me some reasonable answer. I can reiterate on that. That's what the typical flow for language models, uh, large language models are these days. So you reiterate until you get the proper answer. And in the end, you can get some code you can try and use. So if you can't do something because you don't know like how to use it properly in the modern language, let's ask the AI. And yeah, so finally, like the last example about the CMake, so uh, which was in the screenshot. So my CMake actually failed. And so I just ask AI, what's going on? Why it failed? How could I improve it? So another way of um, applying AI here would be, for example, if I would like to start using I don't know, boost test in my project. I can go to the AI and say, how to introduce boost to this specific project? Or how to write a boost test for this specific function? It will generate me some code. I will like copy paste it to the proper files and I will run it. And if the AI had the proper context, quite likely that I will manage to compile that. And at least that will be a good starting point for me to start with the boost test for like uh, my couple of functions in the project. So it helps you to make this first step. It doesn't mean that it will write the whole code for you. <laughs> Don't expect that from AI. But it's a good starting point for you to start working, going further with something you don't know about. So maybe you're not sure how to introduce models or how to use CMake properly. And with CMake, it's a typical thing. You usually don't know how to use it properly. So AI is actually quite good with helping with CMake. I now ask it quite often. Um, yeah. So. If we talk about the specific scenarios where the AI can be helpful, so it basically can, of course, just simply explain you the code or the code errors, right? So for CMake or for C++ code, and there is a plenty of um, opportunities here. So you can uh, like interpret the complex Clang or GCC errors with the like AI, or just uh, ask about what's going on in my CMake or whatever. It can also suggest you some transformations, like some refactorings or a code modernization. So you can ask like, how to like, I would like to move to this standard from this standard in this code base, how to do that? So where, where I should fix my code? 
Uh, yeah, full line code completion is another uh, area where the AI is now very popular. So, um, I mean, like after a GitHub compiler, probably that was the most popular area of applying uh, the AI. And of course, some generating some standard code snippets is also something the AI could help with. And um, yeah, many other things like generating documentation. We one of the feature we added uh, like a couple of days ago when we were releasing the AI support is just generate the commit message. It turns out that it's super popular among our users because they simply like say, generate the commit message for my changes here. AI analyzes the changes and actually produces some nice text. <laughs> Sometimes you still need to update it. As I said, it's a starting point, but at least it kind of got all your changes and tried to explain it in some nice way. And it could be any idea, you know? So um, we are now at the stage when we can implement many ideas with the AI. And again, maybe the regulations will be in, maybe there will be some changes in how we use the AI, and there are many, many philosophical questions around it. But I'm not about that now. I'm just a person who loves doing great tooling and bring benefits to our users so we can create many scenarios and then just follow like whatever regulations are in place. Um, there is a very valid privacy concern for that. And I think the answer to it will be the in-house models and on-premises solutions. And I think, yeah, the guys like NVIDIA will be helping us with that because we'll need the hardware for that. But uh, right now, most of the people are using like the public models. But I guess for enterprise, there will be no choice to do that. So they will be relying on some uh, in-house solutions. And if you talk about the help into the develop for the developers um, in the developers' workflows, I think it's doable. I mean, if you want to have the huge language model that opens, like answers any question in-house, well, you can do that, but it will take a lot of money <laughs> and it will require lots of hardware. But if you want to train it on your specific code base for your specific programming needs, probably it will take less money and less hardware and it will be a good solution for you as an enterprise because the enterprises now, of course, can't like, you know, just simply interact with OpenAI is not an option for them. So, probably will solve the privacy concern, and I guess that will be the main direction here. And all other, yeah, I just mean, let other people solve them, we'll just follow. <laughs> um, that's mostly it, what I had for today. So before we go to the questions, I just wanted to promote our developer system survey, which we launched recently. If you want to participate and be part of this, you know, great numbers and plots, I usually have on my pictures in my talks. So you can just go to this uh, short link and take some time filling the survey. It's quite long, but we're roughly prizes for your time. Um, and yeah, I will switch to the references slide so that you have some links and I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you.